Good morning. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. I'm glad in taking part of this important symposium of the Eucharistic Congressum. Uh, special thanks to the Father Lajos Dolai, the coordinator for the invitation. Um, I prepared my text in Portuguese, and I didn't have time to review the English translation. So I, in advance, ask your, uh, ask your pardon for the, um, some mistakes or uh, lack of comprehension. Uh, forse io avevo dovuto preparare in italiano. Yeah. Thinking about the church in general terms, or just in a few aspects, must take into account that the church is in essence a Eucharistic reality. It is constantly being created and re recreated by the most holy e Eucharistic celebrating according to the determination of the Lord, who has entrusted to him as the new and definitive memorial of Easter. In the light of this traditional convention of faith, and in relation to the theme of, of this presentation, the fundamental question for me is, if the Holy Church has an Eucharistic character, what is in the relationship of the Eucharist to mission and of the brotherly service? In the present ecclesial context, it is important to consider Pope Francis' call for synodal renewal of the church in the context of mission. He raised the issue of synodality when he began his ministry as bishop of Rome. About the word synod and synodality, um, it's common to quote St. John Chrysostom's commentary on the first verse of Psalm uh, 149. In seeking the meaning of the end of the first uh, verse, let his praise resound in the communion of saints the Holy Doctor states that in this verse, we see that God is to be praised in perfect unison, for the church is a congregation in which the most perfect harmony reigns. In the Greek, the later statement reads, Ecclesia gar systematos, kai synodon estin onoma. The literal translation is the church is an assembly whose name is Synod. In the Christian context, the ancient meaning of the word Synod was the ecclesiastical assembly, which includes the Eucharistic assembly. Hence, the idea of the present lecture to explore the possibility of focusing the relationship between the Most Holy Eucharist and mission and brotherly service, starting from Eucharistic ecclesiology and Eucharistic communion itself as model and source of synodal life of church for mission or renewal. The justification of this perspective comes from the fusion of two statements. The first, taken from the decree Ad Gentes, of the, of the Second Vatican Council, which clearly states that the pilgrim church, since it is born, according to the plan of God the Father, from the mission of the Son and the Holy Spirit, is missionary in nature, at Gentis II. The second statement is from the Pontifical Magisterium of Pope Francis, it describes the Synod as the constitutive dim dimension of church. Just like the mystagogical method, we start from the Lex Orandi, then look for its foundation in scripture and the writing of the fathers in order to deepen the centrally important aspect gathered and draw practical conclusions. First, 
Eucharistic Ecclesiology in Lex Orandi. In the new Eucharistic prayers, an implicit element of Roman canon is explicitly introduced. This element was a constant in the tradition of Eastern, Eastern Church, Catholic and Orthodox, the unity of the two epiclesis. The second Eucharistic prayer, for example, present in this way. In the first, first epiclesis, we read, sanctify this gift, pour your Holy Spirit upon it, that it may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. After the passage on the institution of the Eucharistic at the Last Supper and the anamnesis of consecration, the second epiclesis continues. We based beside the Holy Spirit to gather, to gather together all of us who partake of the body and blood of Christ. After the first epiclesis, the congregation at the last, in the Brazilian translation, implores, sanctify this gift, Lord. And after the second, make us one body, one spirit. The sanctification movement of the first epiclesis continues naturally in the second. The sanctification of the offerings is requested so that we may be united in one body at the time of communion. This unity, then, as is clear from the intercessory prayers, is asked for the benefit not only the prayer assembly, but of the Holy Church and all humanity. Cesare Giraudo has devoted much attention to this topic in various publications. This teaching is deeply rooted in the tradition. Its foundation can be found in the scriptures. It is taught by the church fathers and it has been the subject of medieval theology. The more recent discovery of this doctrine, originating in the liturgical movement, has opened up new and profound perspectives for ecclesiology and ecumenism. Ratzinger refers to the Eucharist as the sacrament of transformations. The transformations of the gifts, which is a continuation of the fund fundamental transformation of the cross, in the restoration is not the end, but only the beginning. Ratzinger states, I quote, the purpose of the Eucharist is the transformation of all who receive it in the transformation power of the true sacrifice. The goal is thus unity, peace, so that we, as individual human beings living side by side, may receive one gift in Christ and in Christ, and thus live in hope of restoration and a new world. In this way, the fifth and final transformation of this sacrament becomes visible. Through us, the transformed, becoming one body and one soul with the one who gives life, the holy creation must be transformed. The holy created world must become a new city, a new paradise, a living, dueling place of God. God be all in all. This is how Paul describes the end of creation, which must be with the Eucharist. End of quotation. In the same context, it sheds even more light on his, on his statement. I quote, The Eucharist is a process of transformation in which we participate the power of God to transform water and violence, the power of God to transform the world. Let us pray that the Lord will help us to celebrate and experience in this way. Pray that he will transform us and with us the world into a new Jerusalem." 
End of quotation. As the following, following are examples for scripture and church fathers, allow us to briefly remind that the Middle Ages preserve, preserved the important, this important doctrine. It did so, however, with a distinction that is characteristic of it and which moves it considerably away from the simplicity and poetry that characterize the sacred liturgy. Henri de Lubac presents this doctrinal constance in this way, I quote, from the 11th century onwards, three elements were distinguished in the sacrament, are three levels of depth, but of equal importance for the fullness of sacrament. Sacramentum tantum, which is the external sign, sacramentum et res, the deeper meaning below the sign, and res tantum, the ultimate fruit of the sacrament. The first element is the bread and the wine themselves with the sacrificial rites, forma panis et vini. The second is the body of Christ, Christ himself, veritatis carnis et sanguinis. The third is the unity of the church, virtus unitatis et caritatis. The roots of this ecclesiology we find in the ecclesiology of the Apostle St. Paul. Of St. Paul, the Apostle can be said to be the founder of Eucharistic ecclesiology and the first research in, into the understanding of ecclesial, ecclesial reality that comes from the Holy Eucharist. His most succinct statement in this regard is to be found in his first letter to the Corinthians. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a partaking of blood of Christ? And the bread which we break is not a partaking of the body of Christ? For many are one bread, one body, for we all partake of one bread. 1 Corinthians 10. This is the clearest exposition of a doctrine which in its basis or implication can be found in several other places in his scriptures. At a congress, Eucharistic Congress of the Italian Diocese of Benevento, Cardinal Ratzing reflected on the way in which commune, communion, which is the church herself, is in communion with Christ and in this encouraged us to see this consideration from the perspective of the way in which the Roman canon present the Last Supper. On this occasion, he drew attention to the more important words, noting that it is not just, this is my body and this is my blood, but this is my body given for you, and this is the cup of my blood, the new and everlasting covenant. This blood is shed for you and for all. Body given, blood shed. It is a dynamic reality, a person offering, offering and giving himself. Resurrected, he can be present and continue to function because he has given himself. The church, created by the Holy Eucharist, is therefore an inseparable part of the rising one, who has given himself to him and to whom he joins in sacrifice. He has made himself one with the church so that she may continue to live in him and continue to function through him. St. Paul, in the above quoted passage, draws very important ecclesial, ecclesiastical conclusions from this principle. For example, he exhorts the Corinthians to overcome the social division in their church, Ecclesia. He teaches that the sacrifice is valid as a body, body 
and that its validity is only served by the diversity of its members and their charisms, and initiates a collection for the need members of Jerus Jerusalem community, which then he calls koinonia in the second letter to the Corinthians. Cardinal Henri de Lubac, who contributed greatly to the rev revival of Eucharistic ecclesiology, has collected a collection of statements by the fathers on the relationship between the Holy Eucharist and the Church. He quotes some examples, a lot of examples in reality, um, taken from St. Cyprian of Carthage, St. John Chrysostom, um, I quote uh, one of St. Augustine, who in a mystagogical catechesis with his Neophytes reflects on the Eucharistic sacrifice. It is said then, I quote, the body of Christ, you answer, amen. Thus, be members of the body of Christ, so that you, your amen may become real. From this point onwards, he continues his rhetoric by asking questions about the metaphorical bread we take to ourselves. Why create this mystery with bread? I quote, what is this one bread? His answer to himself is, thinking of the fact the bread is not made by one earth of wet, but by many. In the baptism, you were immersed in water. Then the Holy Spirit descend on you, on you like a fire that boils out the dove. Be, therefore, what you see and accept what you are." End of quote. The great doctor is equally metaphorical about the wine. As for the cup, my brothers, think of how wine is made. Many, many grapes dangle from the, the bunch, but in the must that flows from, from them, they become one. In this way, the Lord has willed that we should belong to him, and on him, on his altar, he has sanctified the mystery of our pace and unity." End of quotation. The Second Vatican Council received this, this ecclesiological eucharistic in some of his documents. The, ba the basis of Eucharistic ecclesiology of the Council is the presence of Christ for the Church, with the Holy Eucharist so excellently realized through antonomasia. This is patent in a simple reading of some their st statements. For instance, Lumen Gentium 3. Every time we present the sacrifice of the cross on the altar, in which Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed, the, word of redemption, the work of our redemption continues. The Eucharistic bread both signifies and accomplishes the unity of believers who are one body in Christ. All human beings are called to this unity with Christ, who is the light of the world, from whom we come, by whom we live, and towards whom we are drawn. The same doctrine we found in the other passages of Lumen Gentium, uh, for, for instance, on the Munus Sanctificandi of the bishops. I quote, is Lumen Gentium 26. This Church of Christ is indeed present in all the legitimate local communities of believers devoted to their pastor, and the New Testament scriptures call them churches. 
for in their place they are the new people of God, called in, in the Holy Spirit and in much, much fullness. It is these local churches that the proclamation of the gospel of Christ gathers the faithful and where the mystery of the Lord's Supper is celebrated, so that the nourishment of the Lord's body and blood may be together the holy community of brothers and sisters. Any communion of altar connected with the bishop's sacred ministry is a symbol of this love and for the unity of the mystical body without which there is no salvation. In these communities, though often small, poor or scattered, Christ is present, whose power unites the one holy, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. For the very effect of sharing the body of blood of Christ is nothing less than to transformation us into what we are we taken to ourselves. And of quotation. And there are several affirmations like that in uh, a lot of documents. One more, the Presbyterorum Ordinis 6. No Christian community is built up without the celebration of the Holy Eucharist and its foundation and cornerstone from which the whole education for the community spirit must be proceed. If the celebration is to be sincere and full, it must lead all the acts of charity to helping one another, to missionary activity, and to various forms of Christian witness. The fundamental aspect of Eucharistic ecclesiology is hence the presence of Christ. The relationship between the Eucharist and the Church, as we have seen in the conciliar texts, is based on the presence of Christ. This theme has been de developed in various ways in the Church's tradition, in relation to the liturgic and beyond, liturgy and beyond. The most important reference scriptural, hence, is for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. As far as the liturgy is concerned, we should note that the presence of Christ is not limited to the church. The doctrine of presence of Christ is, was raised by, by Pope Pius XII. Yeah. In the Mediator Day, the first document to present the sacred liturgy doctrinally, taking into account the result of liturgical movement and point the way to a renew of the liturgy. The theme of presence of Christ in the liturgical action appears in the uh, number 90 the, of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium. Uh, this doctrine is in the chapter 7. And Paul VI brought, uh, brought it up again in his encyclical Mysterium Fidei. We should note that in church congregations, as soon as communion is offered, the community begins to flourish. Thus says the author of the letter to Hebrews, let us not neglect our assemblies, as some are wont to do, but let us encourage one another all the more as you feel the day approaching. The congregation has an active role in the permanent communion of the church. The congregation, the assembly, has an active role in the permanent communion of the church. It encourages perseverance, helps its members to advance in ecclesial life, and creates mutually among them. It also maintains an awareness of the eschatological dimension of ecclesial life. When celebrating the Eucharist, the assembly does not participate in the process of sanctification 
which consists of the bread and wine and words of sanctifying them. But it is at, at the heart of its symbolism. It has a distinctive role in the formation and expression of fraternal communion structuring the church, which, like a mysterious body, is the effect of the Eucharistic. It strengthens the mutual relation which makes the church one body. The sign is a relationship of meaning. It is formal. It is treated for precision in knowledge. Its meaning is equal to the degree of its precision. The symbol has its own consistency, concrete, cognitively, somewhat vague, but with a significantly greater richness of meaning. Symbolism is broader, encompassing all the ceremonial elements that contextualize and enrich the meaning of sign. As a typical sacrificial behavior, the congregation explores the different aspects of the sacrifice of church itself. The first is the presence of the church in the assembly of believers. The church is not the result of a human decision to gather together or to form a society. The church is the creation of God in Christ through the Holy Spirit, but from the specific way in which it appears in particular places, it is strongly linked to a faith, to a faith response to the proclaimed word and to join, joining of those who have already received it. So far, we have been reflecting more deeply on the presence of Christ in the church, but while the text of Matthews is necessary to understand the richness of Christ's presence, other texts, such, such as uh, Luke, he who, he who hears you hears me, associate his presence with the preaching of the word. This is how found in Mark. And they went and preached the gospel everywhere. The Lord was with them in their work and accompanied and justified their teaching with miracles. Another important test that explains our understanding of the Lord's various presence is um, the identification of Christ with uh, who suffer, the poor and suffering. Even if, we, even if we limit our attention to the presence of Christ in the assembly, we must take into account that the primitive church recognized other assembly besides the Eucharistic assembly. In the act of the Acts of the Apostles, for example, we read of meaning to seek answers to the specific problems in the life of the church. The replacement of Judas, the relief of the window of Hellenism, the whether or not to apply the Mosaic law. From, the, from these texts, we can say that the assemblies were also used in the practice of, for judging, judging. But even Matthews 18 is used in the traditional sense, in the sense of Christ was present in the councils and synods. From this Eucharistic ecclesiology and the importance of Eucharistic assembly to be united, united as church, we would like to continue by presenting an application for how the Eucharistic synaxis can be prototype of congregation and a model of the synodality for the, the missional renew. Missional and sino, mission and synodality from the Eucharistic congregation. If you want to draw conclusions for the reflection revealed here, we must make it clear that the fundamental elements of ecclesial synodality derive from the Holy Eucharist which is their source, since it is the Eucharist that creates the church. The Eucharist provides the nourishment 
in word and sacrament for, for the pilgrimage of God's people. He, every time the church celebrates the Eucharisty, the faithful can in some way relive the experience of the disciples of Emmaus. Indeed, the Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life. Regularly realize the synodality of the church. The Eucharistic synaxis is the simplest and the most perfect expression of the Eucharist for the people of God. The communion born of the Eucharist is directed toward mission. The people fed from the altar are the messianic people, as stated at Le Mangentium 9. The sacrifice received encourages us to share the grace received with others. Synodal communion leads us from within to a journey shared with all humanity on which Christianity is the salt, the light, the living. Pope Francis starts, I quote, a synodal church is like a banner raised high among the nations in a world which, while calling for sharing, solidarity, and transparency in pu public affairs, often places the fate of all people in the greedy hands of certain powers, end of quotation. Josef Ratzinger started in his speech, Eucharistic Communion and Solidarity, I quote, he who recognizes the Lord in the tabernacle, recognize him also in those who suffer and are destitute. He is one of those of whom it will be said at the last judgment. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I had no clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Matthews 25. In the, missal, in the missal used in Brazil, one of the responses of the people during the Mass, we are one, no, we are on the way of Jesus, sounds like a synodal acclamation that bursts from, from the heart of the celebration of the Eucharist. Moreover, it has the virtue and beauty of being linked to the Eucharist as a journey to be undertaken by the church. Moreover, it helps us to understand that for the synodal journey, forgive me the tautology, the Eucharist not only gives strength, but also a program and an example. True synodality is a shared journey along the path of Jesus. We walk together on the road which is Jesus himself. himself. Through synodality is achieved through trust in Jesus, in his gospel, in his Holy Spirit, and in the journey his, Christ, his church has made so far. This trust in the criterion for the path it will, it will have to follow in the present and in the future. I would like to finish with a quotation of the Pope Benedict in the last document about the Eucharist, the Apostolic Exhortation Sacramentum Caritatis. I quote, for the love which we celebrate in the sacrament, we cannot keep to ourselves. By its very nature, this love demands to be communicated to everyone. What the world needs is to love of God, an encounter with Christ and faith in him. Therefore, the Eucharist is not only the source and summit of the church's life, 
but also of its mission. A truly Eucharistic church is a church of mission. We too must say to our brothers and sisters with conviction, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, so that you may also be in communion with us. Indeed, there is nothing more beautiful than to meet Christ and to communicate him to everyone. Besides, the very foundation of the Eucharist anticipates what is at the heart of Jesus' mission. The Father sent him to redeem the world. At the Last Supper, Jesus entrusted to his disciples the sacrament that actualizes his self-sacrifice in obedience to the Father for the salvation of us all. We cannot come to the Eucharistic table without allowing ourselves to be involved in the mission that for the heart of God seeks to reach all people. Therefore, missionary endeavor is an integral part of the Eucharistic form of Christian life. I thank you so much. Thank you.